Good morning, almost afternoon. Uh, thank you guys for having me here today. Hopefully uh, I can take a rather broad topic when you think about preparing for critical care boards. That's obviously large. Um, in the cardiovascular disease realm, you actually it's hard to really see where the interface is between chronic care and what is out there and when patients aren't compliant because that never happens. Um, how that leads to some of the stuff here. So it, there is some of a gray area, but I think based upon uh, the breadth of the topic, I'm going to try to do my best this morning to actually hit the highlights of some of those. Um, there's one thing I think a disclaimer up front is I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to make you a cardiovascular critical care specialist. I'm going to actually try to hit the meat of that. And but there, and for those of you, everybody comes from different experience levels. Uh, there, the chapter in itself, for the workbook is quite extensive. Should have a lot of what you need in there. But I'm going to try to hit the highlights. That way, I'm not for the veterans in here that know some of the stuff. I don't want to hit you. Know, bore them, but at the same time, I think there's some fundamental things that you may need. Uh, so disclosures, uh, one, I have none. Uh, tomorrow's my birthday, so I'll be available. Feel free to find me, and we can have a drink or two. Um, I work for OSU. I'm not a Buckeye, but and uh, WVU has a big game later today. Um, find me. We'll, it'll be a good time. Um, learning objectives, this is more or less uh, in the context of the chapter. Um, the, I'm not covering all this today. I think it's important in the context of cardiovascular anatomy to understand the fact that the heart is rather complex by itself. You introduce that into sh you know, critical illness. It, everything gets really muddy in a hurry. Uh, so really even just looking at the hemodynamic status and the things between the right and the left ventricle, the valve of the disease, all the other stuff, things can get complex. I think it's important for any critical care clinician to have some respect of that. Whether you're in a true specialist in that area, you need to understand when you need to ask questions too. I think it's one important thing. You need to understand how that cardiovascular disease relates to your interpretation of, of the patient's course and also see when some of those chronic therapies are actually impeding your care today um, and, and or what else needs come in. I will touch a little bit on uh, mechanical circulatory support and heart transplant at the end. Uh, and whether you have those uh, modalities of care at your center, uh, those, those therapies are growing and you will probably at some point in time, if you haven't already, interface with those. So I will touch base on some of those. So there is a based, uh, more or less an assumed knowledge base leading into this presentation. One, shock is bad. I think Dr. Bauer and Dr. Latt uh, went through this already this morning, but you introduced cardiovascular disease to that in any way, shape, or form, it gets worse. It gets really, really bad. So I'm going to assume that you know some degree about acute coronary syndrome fundamentals and what goes into that. I'll talk, touch a little bit on the drugs, but I think I, I don't. I, I, if you need to refer back to that and where things are in today's practice uh, for updates, that is in that's in the chapter. I'm going to assume that you know tachyarrhythmias and bradyarrhythmias and kind of general types. Uh, those will be covered in a later lecture uh, around ACLS, but there are some con contextual kind of pieces in the chapter as well. And then huff puff or huff rough, however you want to. Uh, describe those more or less systolic or diastolic heart failure. Those are the newer terminologies for this that you know some basic understanding of what those mean to your, your practice. What I intend to expand on today is really built upon what we covered last year uh, and the feedback that we got of what, what the folks wanted to see. So I'm going to expand on antiarrhythmics. I'm going to talk about valve of the disease. I'm going to touch a little bit more on right heart failure because there's a, not a lot of guidance around that. And then I will also expand a little bit on mechanical circulatory support. So with that, I think it's important to know the fundamentals. There are two preloads. There are two afterloads. I assume everybody knows that because you have two ventricles. I think that is... Uh, an important thing to know. Uh, hemodynamic management in the heart. We know hemodynamic monitoring techniques. There, it, it is it, that is not a therapeutic intervention. It is a way to actually guide our decision. So, with that, you also have to understand the the limitations of any of those. And there's an excellent table, I think, in the shock chapter that actually talks about the limitations of each of those different types. Because the important thing to know is. No matter what we do for hemodynamic monitoring, it's our interpretation that guides our care. So if we don't know the limitations of those, we could potentially go in the wrong direction in those cases. And there's not a lot of evidence to say that those actually change the outcome. So a lot of it comes down to how we use the tool, no different than how we use a calculator. A calculator in PK equations doesn't guarantee that I'm going to get the right answer. I need to know when those calculations are wrong, too. Same thing with hemodynamics. Uh, there's going to be assumptions you know some basics about the coronary anatomy. Now, if you haven't revisited this, I, it seems very fundamental, but I think it's important to know that 
not only if we have a blockage, I can have an MI. Yes, that's great. But the other piece is where those infarcts are, where that occlusion is, actually feeds different tar parts of our, our heart. And some of that also will relate to the conduction abnormalities. So understanding, you know, if somebody has, it has a right-sided MI and what's going to happen, how they're going to present, is I think is very important because that's going to take out, in a lot of cases, your SA node. So they're going to become in, you know, somewhat bradycardic. You're going to end up with a lot of right heart dysfunction. But there are some pieces in terms of how that actually relates uh, to your uh, to the care. Anatomy in relation to your EKG. I mean, we think about this single myocyte and an action potential, and then how that translates to the EKG, and then how that further propagates into a 12 lead. Those are things that I think it's important to know, but those are not things that I can cover in, in our hour this morning. So I think that uh, I will touch base on those. How the wheels on the bus go round and round. I think is a cue, is a very important thing, but when you think about right and left, I mentioned there's two preloads to afterloads, you introduce valvular disease and where your hemodynamic monitoring actually is, where, where the things are sitting, whether you're talking about a SWAN, uh, a PA catheter that actually has your measurement up here versus a CVC, where you're transducing the CVP, actually before that, if I have valvular disease, I have no idea what to do. And if I have left side of valvular disease, I further don't even know, I mean, I can't completely translate those pressures. So I think it's very important. This is a comprehensive table. I think it's good to refer back to it. I'm not going to cover all of this, but your your uh, tools in war uh, in the ICU for a vaso uh, for a vasopressor, um, as well as an ino dilator or dilator, uh, means there's a lot of different things you have to consider how those interplay. Um, but when it comes to cardiogenic shock, I mean, I think it's. Um, it can easily be jaded as to, well, they, we need to see what the volume status is and where's the LASIK. So, you know, that's a start, and this, we'll discuss a, 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 some type of inotrope. The problem is, is when you start bucketing things like that into types of cardiogenic shock, there are so many different things that may be going on, and it may not even be one type of those. So you think about the left ventricular failure is probably the thing we see the most. If somebody comes over the uh, a big MI or otherwise, or a reinfarct. There's also, you can have biventricular failure and how things actually have fed in there. That's the chronic disease actually superimposed by an acute event. You have acute my, uh, mechanical dysfunction, whether you have a free wall rupture that's never fun, where you have also a something going on with their valves. You have the cardiomyopathies that may be ischemic. It also may be non-ischemic, which is a laundry list of a bajillion things that have some specific therapies to those. Those are things that are not going to be on the boards. I'd be very support, uh, surprised if something about eosinophilic myocarditis being on the boards, but it's important to know that there are some things here that are specifics to why a patient comes in that you're going to have to dig into. I think it's underst to understand the vast amount of things actually can lead into those. Valvular disease itself, multivalvular disease and it is a huge thing. I think there's been a spark across our population to actually drive the awareness of aortic valve stenosis with the fact that we have now have uh, the, the TAVR uh, procedure, a percutaneous uh, procedure. So I, I know at our institution, our, val our, our valvular <laughs> Aortic valve program in itself has gone up almost fourfold in a matter of three years because it's more of an awareness has gone into the to the community that we now have a therapy for those high risk patients. Arrhythmias uh, and other conditions, there's so many things that go into this, but I know this was mentioned this morning uh, about the SOAPS 2 trial, also probably familiar to most of you. I think it's kind of near and dear uh, in my world because one of the things that actually stands out is dopamine was bad here. Um, now, some people say that this was, you know, called out the moratorium for dopamine maybe in the in a critically ill patient, uh, particularly in the cardiogenic shock patients, um, and because there was a difference. But I think it's important to actually note why that difference existed. So if you look at the heart rate in itself, this doesn't actually speak to your patients who came in bradycardic in cardiogenic shock or the heart blocks. I mean, like, who are the patients we still may consider dopamine and what answers did the SOAPS-2 trial provide us and where do we actually we still need to consider um, maybe further uh, research? I think it's one important thing, though, also, if I do have to, in the face of drug shortages, which never come up, um, if I run out of dope, or norepi, is there a group that actually I would want to conserve norepi for based upon the adverse effect profile? 
I probably wouldn't want to use um, dopamine in my heart, my, my heart and vascular center, or, or at least have some guidance around that for my cardiologists, who commonly don't necessarily read all the same stuff because in the ACC literature, it still gives favor in some degree to dopamine. So, and they say that they're about the same. So, I think that it's some important conversations to have with some of your cardiologists too. But you can see that at least in the SOAP2 trial, we try to characterize this. If I were to look into when when those arrhythmias actually occurred, you're looking in the first 36 hours, and that's even in the face of open labeled norepi. On top of the fact that open labeled norepi and about 20% of them still being on dobutamine, they still we see that do dopamine in that population really drove the incidence of arrhythmias in the first 36 to 48 hours. So I think it's an important thing to consider there, particularly that that is actually what drove the endpoint. In the interest of time, I'm actually going to bypass the first two cases to that way to allow us to get to some of the meat of the topic that people asked for last time. So uh, not that these aren't important, they are in the book, but I, I wanted to bypass that in the interest of everybody's time to meet uh, the needs of at least what we have heard from uh, the reviewers in the past. Um, an important thing about acute coronary syndromes and troponin. It seems rather fundamental. We check them. Uh, they're there. We check them serially. Um, sometimes we make decisions off of them and lead down the acute coronary syndrome route, but I think it's also important to understand what it doesn't rule out. Because troponins, there's a lot of things that actually feed into a troponin elevation. And whether that's a demand ischemia that sometimes you'll hear about in, that can be actually promoted in the case of valve disease. If somebody has aortic valve stenosis and you start them on an inotrope of some sort, you can develop a demand ischemia. Or the same way if they actually tried to do something themselves and it causes a strenuous thing and they can't maintain that cardiac output, they can develop a demand ischemia. There is a laundry list of these things. And the other caveat being even despite the fact that we have a more refined assays where they're looking at troponin eyes or more. Um, troponin also is renally eliminated. So the fact that it stays high, does that mean I'm still infarcting? I, I mean, those are the things that it just tells, we have, we have a problem, we have a myocyte that actually is dying or multiple, um, but it doesn't necessarily, it, it, we, th we think about the degree of troponin elevation being a problem, we also have to think about the fact that it is eliminated renally, and we have a lot of these patients actually have had taken a big hit to their kidneys as well in the face of shock. Um, that being said, we also stratify our patients based upon the revascularization strategies. So certainly we have less invasive strategies, and sometimes that strategy is actually do nothing because we, we at the risk of harm for that patient versus the yield in those actually is going to be based upon, you know, really is it technically difficult? Do they have small vessels? Are the targets we have there for, uh, for cardiopulmonary bypass, or sorry, uh, for cabbage, are they good? It is, uh, is the myocardium viable? It's actually a really big thing. If they've had a large MI, I mean, uh, some people will say dead meat don't beat. In this case, that is uh, that I think is very pertinent because to revascularize dead, uh, myocardium that actually is not there, we need to move towards more of a heart failure management rather than in invasive revascularization. So I think it's very important there. That being said, from a non-surgical revascularization, there is a laundry list. The things that we commonly think about are stent placement. That may not always be the best option. Uh, thrombectomy is something that actually there's actually gotten a little bit of press lately uh, around this because we assume, well, if we go in there, if there's a big thrombus, if we aspirate that, certainly that's going to help, and then we can place a stent or do uh, some type of angioplasty in, uh, with a balloon angioplasty. But um, they've actually questioned whether that practice actually changed the endpoints. So there, there's ongoing investigation into that, so it'll be interesting to see whether that practice is refined in the near future. You still have the uh, POBA, which is a plain old balloon angioplasty, is actually what that stands for. So um, that certainly is something that can be done, particularly in the case that where a stent or somebody has an, a, another surgery coming up, uh, whether that's something that uh, we need to do, at least to temporize the situation. Stent placement, uh, I think, is an important thing. We like to put things in buckets from a black and white picture. Well, if they had a drug eluding stent, they need it for six to 12 months, depending on which data you're looking at, that is still being find in itself, um, or a bare metal stent they needed for a month. Well, when they actually end up with a full metal jacket in there, and there's a lot of stents, I think there's also further discussions of actually whether I can say that that is an always and forever, that 12 months is our end point in most cases or not. Um, so that really is going to be a discussion based upon you know the, the discussions with the interventional cardiologist and the long-term plan. We know at minimum anybody who's had a stent needs to be on aspirin for life. That, that is, I don't think there's any question around that.
However, the, the, where the P2Y12 uh, inhibitors fit in terms of longevity, I think is, there's a lot of other discussions. And that's why anytime somebody's been on this chronically, whether when we make that decision to hold it, I think it forces a discussion that we need to really evaluate how many stents do they have, where are they? Is it in their left main? Because if the left, left main occludes, we have big, big, big problems. Um, how, what types of stents are there? Is it a mix of them? Um, how long has, has it been in? Uh, and I think is a really important thing to understand the endothelialization that has or has not occurred in that face. Surgical revascularization is certainly is an option in some patients. Uh, however, the risks of taking somebody to surgery are also sometimes notwithstanding. So I think it's important to think of your primary indications for this, so left main disease or left main equivalents, and then three uh, multivessel disease are the two pro predominant times when you would want to take somebody to surgery. Other pieces where it, uh, a, a cabbage is showing out to continually uh, be favorable is in patients that have your diabetic patients are showing still to have some degree of a favor and that if you think about the syntax trial is one that has driven that. However, that's in the face of older stents, older therapies, not in the construct of how we practice today and the tools and, and interventions we make. So it's really, there's still some, some unanswered questions there. Nonetheless, antithrombotics, NMI, um, there's been a growth in actually trying to characterize the platelet activity. I think that it's great. It's really interesting to see those things happen, but we still don't know what to do with those, particularly is like how long do I hold it before a procedure? We only have really guidance about what to do before cabbage. We don't know anything else. I mean, and really the level of, in, uh, of the risk of bleeding, the risk of thrombosis in the meantime is certainly a problem. Uh, but when you look at this, the platelet function testing is great, but it hasn't really been studied in the face of durable endpoints. So in terms of how did that actually affect uh, any of your cardiovascular events and mortality, don't know. That, that answer is not there yet. We have a, a guesstimate of what that platelet activity is. Well, the, these, we think they work now, but we don't know. And so there's, I, I think there's further refining, but I think it's going to be important to put those together. So I would not put a lot of confidence in those numbers. It is a surrogate, but it is not one of those durable things that we can actually say uh, is, we can speak the, the, as it's scripture. Common obstacles, though, when we actually face our critically ill patients are one variability in the drug response. It could be because of absorption, because a lot of these patients, these are all, you know, these are uh, usually, with the exception of one of our agents, uh, one of the newer agents, they're all internally absorbed I mean, and administered. So that's a big problem. They're all, most of them, not all of them, most of them are pro-drugs. So that's an important piece too. So if they have some hepatic insufficiency or taking an insult, we have no idea how well they're being turned into the actual active component. So the therapeutic alternatives are limited and not really without, uh, and, and without a lot of evidence of what to do there. So you think about the oral antiplatelet therapies, aspirin being, you know, obviously the one that's been around forever. What it does for platelet inhibition is about 20% onset relatively quick. When you start moving into clopidogrel and prosegrel, you start seeing escalation in the platelet inhibition, but you also start introducing, with that higher inhibition, you also introduce more risk. So the risk of bleeding that come with that. Those two agents actually hit the receptor about the same. Ticagrelor also is probably the newest kid on the block has been shown to be potentially favored. It's also dosed twice a day, so you start worrying about compliance there. You also, the fact that switching patients between these drugs then becomes more difficult um, because how Tagagrelor actually hits the receptor and what it does to produce a conformational change then leads into the fact that if I go from Tagagrelor back to Clopidogrel because somebody can't afford it or any other number of things, they're actually, that conformational change, I have to wait and actually to see when Clopidogrel actually is available to bind to that site because Ticagrelor needs to wear off completely. So there's a discussion and not a lot of evidence around that, but there, there's certainly some opinions around what should be done, which in most cases leads you to reload Clopidogrel or Prosegrel 24 hours later after the last dose of Ticagrelor. So I think it's a very important thing to consider in the, in the risk. It, there's more to it than what you may see on the surface. Um, nonetheless, decisions to hold any of these, I think, really force some very, very important discussions about what is going on and with the risk we may be putting that patient under from a thrombosis, or sorry, a thrombosis risk, based on the stent, versus the risk of bleeding because of that procedure. And I can't stress that enough. 
The parenteral endothrombotics, uh, the one that I do not have up here, and it hasn't, hadn't been used a whole lot, although there's been some recent discussion, is tyrofiban. Um, it went head to head with uh, abcixumab years ago and lost. So it, it lost a good bit of the market share in the face of a lot of our STEMI patients. So that is one thing that has fallen out. There's been, a, because of the cost of these agents from the 2B3A receptors, there's been a resurgence in investigation of these agents and in, in how we manage them is because how we manage them now versus when that was those those studies came out in the early 2000s, we, we do things differently. We don't do femoral approach for everybody. Our time to access is much better. The process is cleaner. We use a lot more radial approaches. And so we've decreased the bleeding risk, but at the same time, we also have agents that were introduced to decrease bleeding risk. So you, depending on the patient that's coming in, a lot of cases we actually turn into more heparin therapies. You know, going back to some very fundamental things, lower cost, lower and high yield, to actually afford the outcome we're looking at. So I think that you're, you're going to see some of the changing landscape and how these agents are used. That doesn't mean they're not pertinent, because if somebody hasn't, you know, heparin can only do so much, it can't actually hit the platelet and actually may activate platelets. So it's important to see if they didn't get that loading dose before they go to the cath lab, or if you've taken them off that therapy and you have no other options, you need to put a straight jacket potentially on that platelet, which a 2B3A receptor would be able to do that. Cangrelor uh, is the newest kid on the block. Um, I think we're trying to learn where that fits. It essentially is going to be very uh, very similar to what we're seeing with the other uh, P2Y12 inhibitors. It actually gets near 100% uh, platelet inhibition. Uh, the other piece is it binds to the platelets um, rever uh, sorry, reversibly, which means it doesn't hit uh, indefinitely. As soon as that drug is gone, the action of the, plate, uh, the, action of the drug in dissipates and your platelets are, are functional. Whereas agents like abcixumab binds to the platelet irreversibly, so it doesn't matter if I stop the drug, the effects are with me until I make new platelets. Okay, so I think it's a very important thing when you think about reversibility of the agent or not in terms of how that translates to uh, clinical care. So the first case, uh, JM has been experiencing intermittent heart rate pauses on telemetry. The team has consulted the cardiac uh, electrophysiology team. In the meantime, which statement most actually reflects whether or not any of the underlying correctable cont contributing causes could be addressed? Uh, because I skipped some of the previous case, I apologize. One of the agencies on is Ticagrelor. Uh, there are also a number of things around heart failure that had to be ruled out. But that being said, of these things, uh, is there, a, given the, the symptoms you're presented with, if Ticagrelor is one of those agents, would you, versus heart failure or pulmonary, uh, pulmonary disease, is there anything actually would stand out here? Good point. It would be nice to know what the electrolyte profile was going into this, right? Minor details. His, his potassium was normal. This is more or less a, a basic distractor. The, the piece here is, uh, in, in, and I apologize for not having the case. I should have shown it earlier. But the, the big piece in this scenario is the patient actually has, has been on, his, his stent was placed in 2006. So in the face of the stent placed in 2006, he actually has been on, on this for a while, and the presenting the signs of uh, the, bra uh, the bradycardia and or dyspnea are actually adenosine in, uh, mediated, really facilitated by, and that's been described very well through the Ticagrelor, that the groups there at times when it is a problem is it actually can facilitate heart block. So, and that's one of the pieces, because the elevation, elevated levels of Ticagrelor, that would be one of the things here, one, does he even need it? In, in the face of this, and, and that's uh, and that I don't think that's been really well described, at, at least in the company's literature. It actually is noted on, but at this, I can tell you how many times this actually comes up in our patients, because you start introducing the core therapies in patients, such as beta blockers and all the other stuff, and then we've switched to Ticagrelor because the, the durable endpoints they've shown in the literature say that, well, it actually may have some favorable benefits, but what they haven't shown you is what happens when you have a problem. And so one of the common things we see come up is maybe having to down their beta blocker or get Ticagrelor on first to see how they're going to respond before we actually superimpose some of those um, and, and titrate them, and, but still make sure that we actually take that into context. So I apologize there. If you have questions about that, come see me afterwards, okay? Um, tachyarrhythmia management. I'm not going to go into specifics about bradyarrhythmia management. Those are usually more... Uh, 
um, more acute, uh, at least in the ICU. But nonetheless, in the face of uh, abrupt discontinuation of chronic uh, uh, the chronic antiarrhythmics, the, any time this, this really should be done with caution. And I think that it's important to know whether, you know, particularly you think about dofetilide and sotalol, things that are used for both ventricular or atrial arrhythmias, um, it's really important to know what that was. Because if it's for VTAC and a history of VTAC, and I hold that agent, I'm, I hope I have a plan in place. And I have a, a, a you know, umbrella plan in place and hopefully a par parachute as well. So nonetheless, we have the risks and benefits of continuation and cessation I think are important. There's a lot of different things we can do to manage these, uh, whether it's atrial arrhythmias, a heart rate control, particularly with class 2, class 4, and or digoxin are things to consider. Heart rhythm control, I mean, the rhythm versus rate has been debated, and I think it's been rehashed even a little bit more lately. Uh, Catheter-based ablation is something that can be done for those refractory arrhythmias, uh, atrial arrhythmias, that's something that can be done. Uh, AV nodal ablation, I mean, it certainly comes up. Surgical ablation by maze procedure, Cox maze procedure, uh, there are ongoing, uh, I think, refinements in that. And then certainly antiarrhythmic therapy with class uh, one, uh, 1C or class 3 agents is something that does come into play. Now, in the book, I I have a comprehensive list of your Von Williams things that really translate that into, uh, it's an appendix, I think it's appendix A, that I think is probably, if you're really trying to see where those fit, I'm not going to go through all those, I'm going to talk about a few of the pearls with that. So again, taking back to the antiarrhythmics and the ECG, you think about phase zero, what this is going to do to your, your class one antiarrhythmics, uh, or your sodium channel. So you're going to blunt your response and really, uh, to more slow that down, which is going to, in the face of ventricular depolarization, is going to widen your QRS is one of the things we think about. So in the face of the class, you know, things that affect the phase two, your calcium, what that's going to do, you think of calcium channel blockers there, you're actually going to decrease, you're, you're going to separate what's going to see between your PR or your PR interval because your time from atrial depolarization until it reaches the AV node is really going to be uh, uh, reflected in this period of time. That is that is how that translates to your care. Uh, so uh, in your calcium channel blockers, beta blockers will also do the same thing. Your phase three, anything that actually reflects a deep a, a repolarization of the cell, so you have atrial repolarization reflected that's actually buried in your QRS interval and also reflected by ventricular repolarization in your T wave. So you're, that's why you, when we do QT monitoring, you're trying to capture everything that actually has hit repolarization. That, that's really where that comes from. So I think that you're, anything that affects the potassium channels and how that translates is, is a very important thing when it comes to the antiarrhythmics. Sometimes in your, there are metabolites or other drugs that actually feed into that, so it's important to uh, understand where those affect. Improvement monitoring of these pieces, I think the QT and QTC are, I, everybody is aware of that, the importance that is a cer a certainly a, you need to have a system in place that, that actually can facilitate that. It's also important to not over interpret it. I think we actually look at your 12 lead EKGs. Um, th those are important things to actually put into context, but if you don't also look and see, well, the patient is V-paced and has an ICD and all the other pieces in place, if somebody has by V-pacing, that that external current through the myocardium actually is relatively slow, and so you're going to see a widened QRS. Widened QRS is going to translate to a wider QT, and, and also fundamentally their QTC. So you got to kind of also be careful over interpreting that and knowing that if somebody is paced. You can't 100% go based upon what, what you're seeing on the 12 lead, and that's the time to actually touch base with your EP physicians as well, or your cardiologist. So, um, nonetheless, in the ICU, I, I really usually get very, um, I, I much heightened awareness around sotalol and dofetilide because one, of these are renally eliminated, um, and I, I think that we have some fluctuating renal function and making sure that we're watching what's going on with the QT um, uh, amidst this. Um, there's a handful of different things here. Whenever we start those, we really need five serial e uh, 12 lead EKGs that are two to, f two to three hours after the administration there. Anytime I introduce a new drug that interacts with them, I really should actually do that again until I'm at steady state of that interaction. So that, I think that's driven home in the actually package labeling. Some uh, institutions actually question that practice a little bit to see if maybe at 87.5% of the steady state, at three half lives, do, is there any change? Can actually I go on that? Do I need the full steady state there? So nonetheless, uh, some other pearls around the, some of the other classes here, your beta blockers, I think everybody's familiar with this. Uh, there are some times where I may pick, uh, you know, based upon the alpha and beta, uh, and that is introduced not only from an antiarrhythmic standpoint, but also in terms of our blood pressure management, and I'm transitioning from parenteral antihypertensives to 
to to orals, how can actually I translate that to maybe somebody came in on Coreg, uh, Carvedilol, and actually they're hypotensive, but that's a home med force to get them back on them. There are going to be times of what that does to my blood pressure. It may be favorable to switch into something more beta one specific uh, is one of the pieces. I think some of the other stuff, and you think of your large vessel disease, aortic dissections, aortic aneurysms, the things you're doing either pre or post other times. Labetalol has been around for a long time, but is highly expensive from a cash price, and we need, and it's also usually three times a day. So you're looking at or ex excess of hundred dollars a month for labetalol, whereas Coreg Carvedilol is looks around about four dollars a month. And a lot of it's on the four dollar med list. So if I'm switching, that's one twice a day, and also is going to facilitate the alpha and beta blockade. So it's some of those things to consider if you're transitioning out of the ICU. I think is one of the important things there. Um, calcium channel blockers certainly come up. I think uh, some. Sometimes uh, we dance this line a little bit. The important that calcium channel blockers are not, I can't, it's not necessarily they can't be used in heart failure. It's, it's systolic heart failure, heart failure of reduced ejection fractions. That's the group of patients, the non dihydrocuperidine uh, calcium channel blockers are really warned against being used in that population. So it's one of those ones that um, you really should avoid because of the increased risk of mortality and increase, uh, and that I think is really what drives that. Um, there are sometimes you have to, whether this is a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy where you may toe the line on some of those, but that's really going to be a, con a conversation with your electrophysiologist. Amiodarone, everybody's familiar with it. We use it everywhere. It is, uh, whether we like it or not, um, None of, it does. It hits all phases. It is that that uh, jack of all trades. Uh, there sometimes I, I watch. I see our nurses get a little bit anxious. We hand them the syringe. It's like, oh, they still have a pressure. They're going, but we need to. We actually infuse that too quick, we, and they take our pressure away. And then we actually we escalate problems. So I think it's the one thing to make sure that remembering there is an urgency in getting them out of the arrhythmia. There's also, we, the first rule of thumb is also not to do any harm. So I think making sure the nurse is aware that the rapid administration in the face of somebody who is tenuous anyway is an important thing that could lead to an event. A lot of times people talk about the 8 to 10 grams that are needed for a load, but not a lot of times do we think about where that number came from. And I think that you know, the therapeutic levels that actually we translate, we think about this in other drugs, Therapeutic levels for amiodarone were established long ago and then along with the PK of that. So we think about where that 8 to 10 gram load actually comes from. The therapeutic levels are 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams per, uh, per liter. So you think we're not going to load somebody with that in a day. We're looking in the course of a week uh, or more in some of those cases. But where the 8 to gram, 10 gram total load goes before I switch them to a chronic uh, dose of like 200 or 400 daily, Comes from that, you think about our concentration, a goal concentration, steady state, times our volume distribution, and the patient's weight. You can see that that's really not too far off, and actually to get there. Levels, surrounding levels, and actually practice of monitoring really has not ever correlated with any practice uh, that actually optimizes anything. If you get questions about whether there's toxicity, that would be the time to actually check it. That's the only time that I can see an amiodarone level actually has any role. Um, nonetheless, we think about lidocaine, I think is very interesting here. I like the pharmacokinetics around it. Uh, sometimes we forget about uh, alpha-1 acid uh, glycoprotein and how that fits. It's an acute phase reactant. Lidocaine binds to that. So you can actually see that, well, we are therapeutic levels. We're good. We're you know, sitting right where we need to be. And then suddenly, about 48 hours, you watch them go straight to the top. And we start worrying about all the neuromonitoring. They're starting to be a little bit more somnolent. Some of that is because that acute phase reactant actually has dissipated. And now we have more free drug floating around. So I think it's important. If I'm on lidocaine, and I've had to turn to this to help facilitate some of that uh, you know, control of ventricular arrhythmias, it's also being aware that Maybe I don't need a level right now, but if I start and I, and I don't have a plan beyond 24 hours uh, for getting off of lidocaine, I still need to actually have that on, then I need to also have a plan to actually see where we're going with our levels and watch for that, that climb in, in the, uh, the level. Dijoxin, uh, kind of bring this out. You know, if we talked about this, you know, three or four years ago, this probably I wouldn't bring it up that much because we don't. I mean, it's one of those anomalies we hadn't seen as much. There's been a resurgence in interest in Dij because it helps keep people out of the hospital. 
seems to kind of go, and that's really its role, whether you're talking heart predominantly around heart failure. The time when DIG actually comes into role uh, for us in the ICU is when I'm backed against the corner and all my other agents are contraindicated, I, the patient will not tolerate, tolerate them. So in the face of DIG uh, is one of the things we actually think about in AFib. However, there have been a couple of studies since then that actually have showed that it may help us, it may be acute, acutely manage them, but there actually has been shown that there may actually be some mortality risk to actually having them on DIG. Now, whether that's the DIG in itself or that's actually the population and the more, uh, that, that we're managing with them, they also probably have a higher risk of mortality in itself. So what I think is very important there. The other piece is in the face of renal failure, we think of a lot of drugs um, in renal failure, volume distribution would go up. Actually, that's kind of the opposite in the case of DIG. Actually, in the face of renal failure, usually your, your volume distribution goes down. This comes into play if I'm actually thinking about my loading dose. Again, goal concentration steady state times my volume distribution. Using population PK, I can see that at least in, if a patient has renal failure, I probably want to be a little bit more conservative in my loading dose. It, it's not a, you know, one of those things that the loading dose is always the same, which is there's some of the physicians out there that think that that is the same. So uh, that's one piece to consider. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the risk scoring around this. Uh, the one thing to really consider is AFib and, and, and thromboembolic risk is something that we have to consider. Uh, there are a lot of tools out there. Your CHADS2, which has been around for quite a while. Uh, CHADS VASC is the newest one and actually is the favorite of them. This tells us nothing about what to do for acute management and anticoagulation risk, uh, anticoagulation and thromboembolic risk in the ICU or even in the hospital. This is an annual risk and this is, I think, is a very important to, uh, to actually really understand. Uh, you also have a lot of scoring systems come around about bleeding and risk of bleeding because that's really the number one question that comes up. Well, I need to anticoagulate them, but I, this is a little old lady, uh, you get a little scared. So we, these scores have actually been put around that. So has bled and the hemorrhages scores, they can help us actually determine this. But the important thing, this is only in the face of warfarin therapy. Only characterizes risk of bleed with warfarin therapy. So it tells us nothing about the new oral anticoagulants. It tells us nothing about heparin anticoagulation. It does, some of those things may translate a little bit there, but we don't have a quantifiable risk associated with that. So I think it's, uh, we got to be careful not to overinterpret that as well. So all patients with AFib ray flutter nonetheless should be evaluated um, for uh, anticoagulation needs, preferably by the CHAS VAS score. Um, a score greater than or equal to is really your time to actually beg the question, do we need anticoagulation or not? Less than that actually is a time where you know probably uh, is maybe reasonable to uh, omit anticoagulation. The other piece that actually comes up is somebody has AFib or a flutter and they also have a prosthetic valve. That prosthetic valve, particularly with the mechanical prosthetic valves, is something you need to consider. Even in the face, in face of tissue valves, there's a question whether you should elevate your INR goals in the face of uh, your anticoagulation. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's very important uh, also not to just look on the surface and say, well, they got a St. Jude valve that's a mechanical one is 2.5 to 3.5. St. Jude makes all types of valves. They make mechanical, tissue, everything, and you got to think about where the location of the valve is and how that translates to, to that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Nonetheless, decisions about the about anticoagulation really should uh, balance the risk of stroke and bleeding. You can look the has bled or the hemorrhage score, I, I think, is a little bit of guidance, but again, it's hard to say how those quantify uh, you know, their risk completely. In the critically ill, a lot of times we're going to lean towards unfractionated heparin or, uh, or even in some cases, low medical weight heparin. But again, uh, you got to really be uh, kind of, it's one of those things to manage the acute piece. The other piece is anticoagulation after uh, cardioversion, whether that's pharmacologic or it's by direct current cardioversion. You really have to, once you actually have ruled out that they have a thrombus, particularly on the left side of the heart, uh, or if you don't know for some reason, you need to really be careful cardioverting them unless you have unless you ruled them out because you really could just stroke them out like that. The next part is though, if they do get cardioverted and you ruled out that thrombus, they really need anticoagulation at least for another four weeks and potentially longer. Um, that's a bit, and, and unless you have some contraindication against that, and I think that's an important thing to drive home. Uh, in when is that point in time when you'd like to start the anticoagulation, balancing that risk of bleeding and risk of stroke? Patient case four, MB is a 76-year-old woman now in sinus rhythm, heart rate of 98. Uh, after being cardioverted this morning by direct current cardioversion for AFib with RVR and hemodynamic uh, instability. Um, her medical history includes an unspecified arrhythmia, hypertension, free, frequent epistaxis, and diabetes. Her calculated chas vas score is 5, her has blood score is 4. The physicians considering anticoagulation asks, for, asks you for a recommendation. 
Excellent. That's, uh, uh, that thing is important. I, we, uh, C is the correct answer. Part, uh, one, it's, it's maybe less relevant in telling us what to do acutely. I think it's important to understand that that, that bleeding risk is there. The CHADS, uh, the anticoagulation is likely warranted given the elevated CHADS VASC. So long-term discussions, we need to start with an acute management, at least have some idea when that comes into play. Uh, but that this patient, definitely given the cardioversion this morning, should be anticoagulated or at least have a plan for anticoagulation in the near future. Oh, okay. Um, heart failure etiologies, and I'm going to go through uh, briefly here. Um, there's a lot of different things. Ischemic cardiomyopathy accounts for two-thirds of this population. Um, and that's, I think, is, and mostly it's because of myocardial damage due to coronary artery disease. But the laundry list of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, which accounts the other third, is huge. There's a lot of different things around there, and I think it's uh, th this is a slippery slope. And sometimes if you have to really know the rule out all of the other things before you can guide some of these. I mean, you think about the myocarditis; some of that is going to be get, uh, driven by biopsy and otherwise. And so, where that fits and how that translates, it's a lot of other different things that actually come into this. Um, Hokum is one. Has anybody heard of Hokum? So Hocum is more or less an obstructive and a left ventricular, uh, it can lead to a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. It's where your left ventricle hypertrophies and because of that, uh, you essentially get a, you, 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 it, the myocardium actually occludes the aortic valve opening and so you end up, as that demand goes up, you have more systole, you have no filling and you have no output and so it's bad. And a lot of that is, you can be described uh, in another thing that is in the chapter is called SAM. SAM and HOCUM, sometimes go hand in hand, but uh, systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet is another piece in the, in the cardiac world that actually can lead to an outflow tract obstruction. Not going to go through all of those, but it's really cool stuff and it's one of those things that would change your therapies, particularly in like ACL situ ACLS situations, epi would be one of the things I would not want to do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the right ventricle. Um, and when it comes to the, the heart failure world, we can go through a lot of those things. There's a lot of the fundamentals covered in the chapter. I think the right heart is, I'm, I'm a fan for the underdog. Um, but I think you got to characterize why that is the underdog. The right heart, some people don't think it's like the heart's a heart. I mean, it's, it's it, it, it. But you have to think about... The right heart is about, the myocardium there is about one-sixth the amount of myocardium on the left side. So this is a short axis view, so essentially if I did an echo, a TEE, and I looked straight up from the bottom of the heart, you can see that the amount of myocardium there is, it just doesn't have a whole lot to work with. But it usually doesn't need to because your, your PA pressures really aren't elevated, so it doesn't need a whole, and myocardium, or its muscle in itself, is expensive to keep around. So that's an important thing, but one simple rule is the right heart output, the right ventricular output needs to approximate the left heart. So but because of these physiological deficits, it's highly sensitive to afterload increases. So some drugs elevate our PA pressures. There's also times when I overload a patient, you know, volume overload, and I fill that RV, then there, you know, whether that's blood or otherwise, then actually it doesn't have the same elastic response and, you know, when it comes to styling curves as what we're going to see with what the LV is set up. So it actually can crump as much too. And you change the geometry of the right ventricle, you change its function. You lead to more tricuspid valve regurgitation, all kinds of bad things. So it's kind of, there's a delicate balance in the right ventricle, and I think it's important to understand that. So it is preload dependent, meaning that you need to have the right amount, but you have too much or too little, you can get into trouble. If you have too much, you start displacing some of the, the uh, septum and what that actually contributes to some of the output, um, because it really is just some people, <laughs> one of my intensivists described it as a wet napkin laid over uh, the, the, the septum. So there's not a whole lot there, and it needs a rigid septum to beat against, and so I think is an important thing. There's so all kinds of drugs that actually can, uh, can elevate your PVR uh, and also conditions. We never see any of those hypercarbia, hypoxia, any of the other stuff in the ICU. All those actually feed into elevated PA pressures, which then contribute to the problems with the right heart. So it sometimes is set up for a bad, bad disaster, so you kind of have to have some respect to that, and it's, it's very interesting nonetheless. Um, when it comes to RV dysfunction and failure, there's so many other things actually lead into this that I think it's also to look at that in the context of your patient and how that actually translates. And there may be more than one of those. And so when you select out what you can do to help a, a patient in the right ventricle, an inotrope is going to be a limited yield because I don't have a lot of myocardium to work with. So I need to think about my right ventricle. Its predominant response is heart rate to actually facilitate compensation. So you need to have some diastolic filling time, but you also need to have some time to allow it to have RV output. Same time, mitigating some of the afterload effects and what that goes into. And so we think about, we turn to nitric oxide or inhaled epoprostol, some of the other inhaled vasodilators that when they actually start there, they're going to go selectively to the alveoli that actually are being ventilated. 
which means I'm going to facilitate gas exchange around through those capillary beds around them. The areas that aren't well ventilated, then I'm not really affecting that, so I'm not facilitating a, a shunt to those areas that aren't doing well, gas exchange well. So I think it's, what that is going to do, one, is improve gas exchange, two, decrease PVR, three, help my right ventricle. Those are, that's the holy trinity where you, you think about the things that comes to the right ventricle. So in the face of, you know, revalvular disease, though you inhale vasodilators in the face of a left heart failure um, or something there, I, if I have left heart failure and mitral regurgitation and I introduce something with an inhaled vasodilator, I've increased their ability to actually do backward flow. So I may, may essentially drown those patients because you're, you're, you're facilitating pat resistance uh, to actually the blood flow to go backwards. So it's important to know where valvular disease fits in your management of the patient uh, with those. So I, I think you can't, can't interpret all of their cardiac function without knowing what's going on with their, their valves and if they have a history of valvular disease and what's going on now. I think is very important. And whether that's stenosis, what does that mean for your hemodynamic interpretation? Is that regurgitation? How does that mean to what I do for afterload reduction? What does that mean for what I do for interpreting uh, some of their, their PA catheter numbers or other things? There's a lot of things you have to consider with particularly valve disease. Prolapse uh, is certainly something we consider and uh, that actually if they had a chronic prolapse also they're usually higher risk of endocarditis uh, from some passive things there. So that's some of the things there. Endocarditis in itself is a very complex thing, particularly in the face of all the increasing IV drug abuse that actually we see. I feel like we see a ton of this anymore. Um, and that, what that does is valvular regurgitation and managing the patient, it comes into a lot of different things. There's other pieces around valvular uh, malformation that come into it, but I think it's important. Um, there's a lot of different options, growing options of what we can do uh, for intervention. And, uh, and whether that's a balloon value of plasty, although it's a more of a temporizing solution, you really need to have an end game in there. Uh, that's usually comes in the face of aortic valve stenosis, that they would do this temporarily, see how the patient responds, and then have a plan for a TAVR, which is the transcatheter aortic valve replacement. The other pieces are more traditional surgical approaches to this. Um, but I think it's very important to see how those actually translate to the after management. And there's a table in there. The important thing to know about valve disease, and one of the most things that uh, comes up outside of hemodynamic management, is the anticoagulation. There are three different guidelines out there that exist that talk about anticoagulation. They don't even, and they don't say the same thing. It'd be nice if we had, you know, they'd come together, have a little meeting. It'd be great. So in, in your booklet there, I actually have a compilation of the evidence around those uh, and levels of evidence maybe where the evidence isn't described, at least in that guideline. I think it's important within your own practice to actually take that to your surgeons or at least in the surgeon's practice to see what is their, where, what is their stance so we can have a standardized practice within our institution to see what's expected. The other piece actually comes into this is mechanical valves. Low molecular weight heparins are com commented there, but there's very little, if any, data about low molecular weight heparins perioperatively. Uh, they actually compare apples to apples of a heparin infusion and treatment dose low molecular weight heparins uh, in the cardiac surgery realm. And it is sometimes translated to chronic management. If you look at the chest guidelines, it's a, have a, I, I can have a long discussion about that if you want to afterwards. Uh, but I, I'm very, I'm very uh, passionate about what is not there. Um, the valve thrombosis is an important thing too, because this is what happens. Is like if we if we dance with the devil and we do another therapy uh, that may not have a lot of evidence, or maybe I'm not going to do it yet. The valve thrombosis is a problem, right? Because what happens if I have a thrombosed valve? Where does the patient go? They die or they go to surgery. Risk of reoperation and bleeding is a problem. So you got and 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 alteplase and some of the other thrombolytics are have a low yield in those. And whether we're talking right heart versus left heart valve thrombosis, so I think it's a very important thing to actually also think about what are the risks of bridging somebody with some of those other therapies and where that fits and make sure that it's a risk adjusted approach to that. Um, I'll talk a little bit, and we have about 10 minutes roughly for the advanced heart failure therapies. And this is where we had a lot of questions last year. Can you at least touch base a little bit more on this? Um, this in the advanced heart failure, there is, is a dynamic progression. And I think this, even this picture probably doesn't completely do it justice. And you think about optimized medical management. Um, historically, our options were either heart transplant, which is kind of the gold standard, or palliative care and or death. That's where that's the world we lived in, but with the growth and of advancement in technology, we now have a lot more options. So when it comes to mechanical circulatory support, we think about is this a bridge to actually get through the acute event, and what is that bridge? Are we what are we bridging to? 
Um, so some of that is a destination therapy is one of those, meaning that if I put in a, a durable VAD destination and they don't have an option right now for anything else, they can't go to transplant, that is their next step. Now, does that mean that they are, because they are a smoker or they had a history of other non-compliance BMIs too high, does that mean that if they change those facets that they can't become a transplant candidate? Yes, they can. So that's why I say it is a dynamic progression that over the course of time that things can change. When it comes to all, uh, usually the short-term mechanical support, we actually think about bridge to candidacy or bridge to recovery, and whether we're talking about a balloon pump, which is still a type of mechanical circulatory support, uh, venal arterial ECMO would be one, the impella device, Centromag, Abiomed ventricle, tandem heart. There's a lot of there's a laundry list of things, and that's not even all of them. When I mean, you think about the things that are out there and and or growing. Um, so in those cases, you, you're thinking about where those therapies are and really the next step for the patient. And some of those, we actually, I think, say, I've been at OSU since 2008, we've explanted, I think, around four patients who've had a implanted LVAD, who've explanted and recovered. They have, haven't seen them since then. So one of them actually still, actually one of them still volunteers at our hospital, but she's doing great. Uh, so there's a, it can happen. Um, ECMO is a, a, one of the four-letter words everybody kind of hears about, some people are scared about. Amy and I have done a lot of work with this too. LVADs are another four-letter word sometimes, sometimes that come up. But if you're not familiar with them, I think there's, I'm going to build a little construct around there because the chances of you interacting with these in the future, you see the H1N1 in epidemic that launched in 2009 really had a growth of resurgence of some of these the therapies and where they fit. Uh, same thing actually you can see with LVADs, the growing use of those. So it, uh, it, at some point we have to embrace it and actually see where it, where it fits for us because a lot of these patients, while they may be implanted with VADs at, a, at one of the major medical centers that a lot of times are managed within their smaller communities, which may lead to a trip to some of the ERs and otherwise. Uh, mechanical circuit stories, general principles around this is uh, for the, the, from a cardiac standpoint is destination therapy, which I mentioned, and bridge to transplant are, two, are essentially the two times that you actually see most of that come up. Uh, bridge to candidacy and bridge to recovery are discussed. Um, different centers actually have different practices around what these fit, but a lot of times, whether this is a device that actually is being listed in there in a study, those usually are either going to be a destination therapy and it's a specific trial for that to see outcomes, or it's a bridge to transplant and they have to be listed within X number of days of being implanted by the, by, with the LVAD. So that, I think, is an important piece. Uh, there's a lot of different things with the, the, the different devices. I'm not going to go a whole lot into the balloon pump. Everybody should know the predominant piece where it fits is afterload reduction, but it's selective afterload reduction. It happens during systole, then increases. Uh, essentially the, the um, perfusion in mean arterial pressure during diastole, so you can increase the diastolic filling uh, of your coronaries. Uh, nonetheless, as your support decreases, you need to start thinking about anticoagulation. There's not a lot of characterization about what has to happen for anticoagulation with the balloon, but there are certainly some considerations. As it becomes more static, you increase risk of uh, thrombosis. The impella and or tandem heart are more percutaneous. The impella is a, a long story in itself. There are some certain heparin uh, considerations that come around with that. I think that uh, the, the company has lost some oversight on that, but I think a lot of the pharmacists who see this through the ACC PRNs as well as SCCM discussion, ways that we can actually increase the safety and still facilitate this as a viable device. They just introduced a right ventricular uh, impella device that actually has in, uh, introduced a new modality to help with temporary right ventricular support. Uh, I think may change some of the landscape for some of the struggles we've had historically. Um, ECMO, I have a description here, at least uh, the differences between VV ECMO and VA ECMO, if you're unfamiliar. I think it's uh, either which way, it is very important to understand how a patient has been cannulated when it comes to ECMO, because that is going to tell you how uh, how you can interpret some of the, uh, the blood flow in the heart. And like to, you think about veno arterial ECMO, if I take the blood from essentially around the right atrium, so from an outflow cannula, and I have in the arterial side is actually going up through my femoral artery. Uh, you know, you think about if we femoral cannulation, that's blowing blood retrograde up my aorta. And so that's an, you know, understanding how those things change versus in VV ECMO, I need to have a heart that is functioning because if I take blood out and put it back in and deliver it right to the right ventricle, I need that right ventricle to work. 
I need the heart to work. I need everything to flow through the, the pulmonary vascular circuit in order for that therapy to actually help us. Okay, But it's also understanding there's a lot of other pieces that could actually come into play, whether it's anticoagulation and stuff. I have a depiction at least of how this actually translates to LVADs. You can see that a left ventricular assist device, this is a picture of a HeartMate 2. You have your... Um, your outflow cannula, more or less your outflow conduit out of your left ventricle goes in from the apex. So, and your, your right ventricle still needs to work. Still needs to work. Uh, importante. All of our perioperative management goes around supporting the right ventricle. Then from that, your left ventricle still is actually going to actually pull, uh, it, it will still beat. They still have outflow out of your aortic valve in addition to the continuous flow that goes through the VAD to the, ascend, or to the ascending aorta. So that ascending aorta still is going to have blood flow that goes back to your coronaries, as does the outflow out of your, aorta, your left ventricle out of there. So it's important to know that if I keep the patient completely pulseless, there's only one thing that generates pulseless flow, and that is the VAD. So if that the aortic valve is not opening at all, then I can get a root thrombus, an aortic root thrombus. So if suddenly we do open that valve again, then I can stroke them. So I think it's important in terms of what we do with the VADs. There's a couple of different pieces here. The only piece that we really set is the speed of the device. That translates into the flow that comes out of the ventricle and will tell us essentially how much support we're generating with that VAD. Same thing actually is very similar to what we'll see in ECMO. We set the speed, which translates to how much flow we're getting through the device, which will it tells you how much of that reoxygenated blood is being delivered back to the patient. So, uh, very important things here. I could spend a lot of time on this. There's a lot of questions. I think it's very interesting flow uh, with this, but I think the, I really need to drive home the importance. If a new patient, if you're not familiar with these devices, what do you need to be concerned with? They land in your unit. Long-term support with LVADs has really dynamically changed what we can do with heart failure patients and, and really keep them out of the hospital, uh, uh, facilitate activi activities of daily living that they have not done for years. That being said, the utilization is kind of limited right now because of uh, it, it, because you're, it, there's a lot of actually consideration around what you have to do for right ventricular management acutely and chronically. Uh, infection is an important thing. They have a drive line that actually comes out of their abdomen that actually goes to the power supply and the controller. That is tunneled through there. That drive line is actually probably one of the biggest sources of infection. The patient needs to know how to manage that. But that's probably the, one of the biggest reasons why they come back in is a bad drive line infection. Same way with valvular disease. You actually can have the VAD itself cause valvular disease because you have a negative flow. You can cause regurgitation, a handful of pieces there that actually can uh, uh, contribute to how you're managing the patient. Hemorrhage is the other probably hemorrhage and stroke, uh, which go along with, one, the device itself, and also the anticoagulants that we use. So your GI bleeds are the other piece you're looking at anywhere from 14 to 40 percent uh, risk of GI bleed um, in these patients, and that and it's not by always because of the anticoagulants. You think there's other things such as acquired von Willebrand's disease that come into place here. You have uh, the exposure of um, unknown arterial venous malformations that then now leak because they don't have a, a resting phase in that capillary bed. Uh, and then certainly bad thrombosis is probably one of the biggest ones. Uh, is a hot topic. Um, ooh, we stuck? Okay. A number of different things there. Please, uh, if you have questions, uh, please let me know. But uh, hopefully this at least gives you a good introduction. Thank you.